My name is Ray O'Keefe. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Miami men's group, a bunch of chauvinistic losers, and uh, <laughs> probably the worst bunch of incurables that have ever assembled under one roof and call themselves an AA group. I have one announcement here that was left by Bob. I'll just take a minute. So this is from the hotel. It says, in case of fire, would all the al please remain seated? <laughs> Until the alcoholics are well clear of the building. <laughs> Sounded important to me. Uh, I've been happy to be here this weekend, and I've seen some old friends and met some new friends, and I've, I've certainly admired this work behind me here, of the young Clancy Imerslin, uh, explaining the AA program to the psychiatrist at the Big Springs Institute in Texas. <laughs> Marvelous. It's inspirational. Is, is so they asked me over here because I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous a long time. And you can tell by looking at me, I've been someplace for a long time. <laughs> I, I grew up, uh, or at least I got a little taller, in uh, one of the neighborhoods in New York City. And my neighborhood was rough, and it was tough, and it was Irish. Now, you may not understand it here in Tampa, but they drank in that neighborhood. <laughs> you would actually see people on the sidewalk under the influence of alcohol. Difficult to believe, yes. <laughs> if you look where I live, you see a little drinking. My mother, the widow O'Keefe, uh, was known to take a drink from time to time. If the pressure got on, Kitty would go for the light wines and the spirits, and something would fly, usually one of the children. Uh, <laughs> I found out about four years ago I'm from a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Functioned all right for me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Breakfast at seven, dinner at six, and don't be late. And that was it. Uh, my brother Billy, uh, on the other hand, was a raging alcoholic. And uh, in, a, in a neighborhood of Irish drunks, Billy O'Keefe stood out. So when I dropped by the local place... Uh, and ordered up whatever it was they were serving 14-year-olds that afternoon. Uh, nobody paid any attention to me at all. It was just another O'Keefe coming through the system. I guess I got a beer. That was a neighborhood drink. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't, but I think it was a beer. Whatever it was, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked the way it looked. I liked the way it smelled. I like the way it tastes. I like what it did for my head. I like the noise and the smoke and the confusion. And I like the fist fights and the Irish music. I like the bullshit. That's what I like. And I spent the next 20 years going after it. I was going through the parochial school system, in a manner of speaking, and I got into all of the difficulties that you would imagine a young man would get into trying to go through that system drunk. Uh, I was thrown out of high school a number of times. I held the neighborhood record for being thrown out of high school, a record previously established by my brother Billy. <laughs> because of... of uh, somebody's error or mistake, or maybe even a miracle, uh, I ended up going to college. And that uh, was unusual. <laughs> somebody like me would go to college. But I went to college, and off I went uh, to college, and I had to go up there in the state of Vermont, and uh, 
When I arrived, I found it was a culture shock. There were no bars in the state of Vermont. Uh, there were only restaurants, and you sat at tables and drank beer out of bottles. And so I learned how to do that. And you sit around these tables, you drink the beer out of bottles, and you sing dopey songs, and they wear white shoes in the wintertime. So I did all of those things, and I was going to college, and World War II was just about over. Looked like a pretty good bet that we were going to win. And uh, so one day I got a haircut, and I joined the Navy. And I ended up on a minesweeper in San Francisco. Uh, I hate to be indelicate to such a nice group of people. But I have to tell you, I had a lot of trouble with my kidneys when I drank. And in the Navy, we slept through to a tier, three to a tier. Don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> it's not so easy up there. So I did my first liberty in San Francisco with all the beer in me I could buy, and I came back to the ship, went to sleep, and I had one of those accidents. But I met the fellow who slept below me. <laughs> I suppose he imagined he'd be wet sometime during his naval career, uh, but it hadn't occurred to him it would happen while he was sleeping. So I was immediately transferred to a lower bunk. And the rest of my naval career was just as distinguished as that. And I came back home about three and a half years later, undecorated, unhonored, unloved, and uh, back to the neighborhood. Everything was over the, under control in the neighborhood. The widow was out in the weeds somewhere. My brother Billy was missing from the New York City Police Department. Uh, Billy had had a misunderstanding with a citizen who was thrown off a five-story roof. And the citizen lived to identify the Irish cop who threw him. <laughs> so Billy went west and uh, went into another line of work. <laughs> Uh, he went into a more peaceful line of work. He went back in the Marine Corps. <laughs> uh, veterans were getting $20 a week for 52 weeks. I signed up for the club, the 5220 club. I gravitated to the local place. I took up the game of shuffleboard, and I was planning a life of... Would you be glass of that? You're just sitting there. Hanging around. Come here. <laughs> Airline captains. Uh, <laughs> airline captains. Jesus. Sure you're all right? Okay, thank you. Jesus. <laughs> I was planning a life of petty crime uh, with some of my boyhood companions. You know how it works. I had a clear thought one day. I said, oh, I've been to college. I forgot. <laughs> so I got on a bus, and I went back up there. And there they were. I walked in. They were sitting around this table, drinking beer out of a bottle, singing those songs, wearing no shoes. So I got another pair of shoes. Now a grateful government was sending me a check every month. And that was good. <laughs> Of course, I was moderately stewed all the time. And one day I was staying around the campus in my usual condition, and I saw a list of names on a bulletin board of people qualified to graduate. And my name was on the list. And that was excellent news. I thought I had another year to go. <laughs> so I called up the widow and told her about this event. And she came north, and that was a very, very tender sight. The widow and her youngest child staggering around under the elms. That was beautiful, as we say in the Bronx, beautiful. I served as a trustee of that college, and I would go to meetings, and they were still talking about my mother. Isn't so often in the state of Vermont they see a little old lady get off a train drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now the question was what to do with this degree I had. And 
my uncles, my uncles who ran the family, were all Irish and they were all cops. And they voted unanimously that I be a New York City policeman. That's what my father had been, but he died when I was two. And that's what my brother Billy had been, and that's what all my uncles and my cousins were doing, except for the two morons that worked for the telephone company. <laughs> but I told them that, uh, that uh, I would not uh, be available for the police department, that I had uh, received a scholarship to law school. And I'd be unemployed for the next several years. <laughs> and that was received with mixed emotions. So off I went to law school. And I didn't know anything about lawyers or law school or anything like that. We didn't have any lawyers in my neighborhood. We had cops and we had priests. <laughs> we didn't need any lawyers. <laughs> I hate to be disloyal to the profession that's made Jerry Jones a wealthy man, uh, but I have to tell you that uh, when I got to law school, I was in the company of the greatest collection of stiffs that had ever assembled under one roof. Oh, they were so deadly. And they all had on a blue suit and a pair of eyeglasses. So you know, I got a blue suit. I got some glasses I didn't need. And uh, I looked around for somebody to get drunk with, and uh, nobody drank in that crowd. They're all studying. They're all grinding it out. So I became the biggest grind they ever had in that place. And uh, as, as a result of that, when I came out of law school three years later, I was taken into a large, white, Anglo-Saxon, Wall Street law firm. They hired me as sort of the resident immigrant. <laughs> It was not a total loss, however. I did learn to say, oh, really, instead of no shit. <laughs> we say that a lot. Oh, really? <laughs> My superiors there determined that I should be trained as a trial lawyer. And so I was sent to the New York City courthouse to learn my trade. And I wasn't in the courthouse very long when I discovered that the really bright people were across the street in a saloon. So I moved my office into the saloon. <laughs> and I learned to drink in a different, a more civilized, a more genteel fashion. I learned to drink scotch in a tall glass with ice. And you sip on that. It, it takes a little while, but it gets the job done. I was introduced to all of the mysteries and all of the rituals that surround a very, very dry martini. And to this morning and to this minute, my love, my admiration, and my affection for the very, very dry martini is surely the greatest case of unrequited love the world has ever seen. I was so loyal, and they destroyed me, those things. It came time in my natural development to be married, and I had located this lady, or she had located me. Who knows huh, how these things work? Uh, Ms. O'Keefe, my wife, my current wife, I always call her my current wife, I find it keeps her on her toes. <laughs> She's from a very different background than mine. She's from a very nice family, devoted parents, and a house, and a fence, and a dog, and uh, so forth. Her family, I hate to be crass, but uh, in a word, her family had a buck. I will not burden you with the details of my wedding day, but I assure you that when the O'Keefe's from the South Bronx <laughs> hit the Westchester Country Club, <laughs> they set a few records. 
there was only one fight. My Uncle Bernie hit a waiter. And <laughs> so we settled up and, and uh, settled down and uh, set up housekeeping. And Ms. O'Keefe began to produce children uh, in a rather boring and monotonous fashion. And with the regularity that is known only to the Roman Catholic. <laughs> and we had a lot of kids, a lot of kids. And after a couple of years or so, I had a phone call from the Fordham University School of Law, uh, law school I had attended, to come down and see the dean. So I went to see the dean, and he appointed me to the faculty, and I became Professor O'Keefe. And I got very nervous about this position because I really didn't know what there was in my background that justified this kind of an appointment. And I knew that I drank too much. So I decided that I would drink less. Logical, eh? And so I did. I tried to drink less in order to be comfortable in that job. And I was never able to do it. I tried, but it just didn't seem to work. A lot of other things got in the way. But after a few years of teaching, it turned out that I was a competent teacher. It was all right. I could do it. So then I didn't even have to worry about trying to control it. As long as I could do the job, I was all right. So I back out to drink the way I like to drink. In fact, it was the only way I knew how. As I mentioned, my father died when I was two. Uh, Billy, my brother, was four years older. And if you put us side by side, we would not appear to be related. He was about 6'3 and good-looking and athletic and all the rest of it. And he was my big brother and my hero. And I did everything just like Billy did, or I tried to. And I drank like Billy. I drank until I fell down. Or the cops arrived, or the place went on fire, or something. That was the way Billy did it. That's the way I tried to do it. I see people leaving. I see them going. Oh, where the hell are they going? The whiskey is here. <laughs> They're going over. That makes no sense. Well, and uh, Ms. O'Keefe and I had it up to, uh, I'm trying to remember now. We had it up to six or seven kids. <laughs> Maybe some more. I can't remember. A lot of kids. A lot of kids. <laughs> They're all over the place, you know? and uh, we had a big house, and we had cars, and I belonged to the country club, you know, and had you asked me how I was doing in those days, I would have told you I was doing very well. As a matter of fact, I would have told you I was doing very well, whether you asked me or not. <laughs> One of my favorite stories. Truth of the matter was that... Uh, at this time, at age 34, I was a daily drunk. And I was drunk every day, all day. And I'd wake up in the morning and start throwing up and all of that stuff. And, and I drank all day long. I put away two and a half to three quarts of vodka every day. And uh, I went to New York and struggled, you know, and hit bars. And then I was trying to teach, which was a big joke. And so forth. I was running, I ran for office. Polit I ran for political office. I lost. <laughs> the guy was, I ran for mayor of my town. And the guy said, he's only lived here a year. I said, I got here as soon as I could. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, now, you may not believe some of this, but I'll tell you. While all of this was going on, Mrs. O'Keefe was not entirely silent. <laughs> believe that? True. From time to time, she would have the temerity to suggest there was something radically wrong with the way that I drank. But if I pay no attention to her, why should I? First of all, she is my wife. How much can she know? <laughs> Secondly, she's not an attorney. She does not have the benefit of a legal education, so what's the point, you know? <laughs> and because she's a little on the dim side, anyhow, I used to explain things to her. 
and I will explain to her the relativity of drinking, which is to say that some people drink more than other people. Are you, are you with me on this now? And on a relative scale, I was not a very big drinker. As a matter of fact, I would say, I don't drink as much as my mother. <laughs> and she would say, nobody drinks as much. <laughs> so I'd have to leave. She insulted my mother. I, I go over and see mom, and we'd really do it. Uh, this drove her a little crazier than she usually is, and so she betook herself to her physician, who, as you might imagine, is an obstetrician. <laughs> Did I say the wrong word? But, and uh, he uh, could not find anything the matter with her until she told him about me. And then he, uh, he told her about me. He diagnosed me, and I am one of the few men in Alcoholics Anonymous, who have come here upon the advice of a gynecologist. <laughs> this is all true. This is all true. And she told me that her doctor, the obstetrician, God bless you, sir, and your whole family, She told me that her doctor, the obstetrician, had diagnosed her husband, the law professor, as an alcoholic. Oh, Jesus. I was so upset. I rose to defend myself, as is my custom, and I took a very, very dim view of a physician who would diagnose a patient without ever having seen the patient. I was against that shabby type of medical practice all too common in our country today. <laughs> then I went into high gear and I asked Ms. O'Keefe a question to which she has not yet discovered the answer. I asked her what kind of a man became an obstetrician in the first place. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> and at this point, the conversation was coming downhill at a very, very terrible rate. And then it happened. I don't know how this happened. I cannot explain to you how this happened. I can explain many, many other things to you, and I probably will in the second or third hour of this terrific talk I'm giving you. <laughs> but in the middle of all of this, I stopped and I admitted to Ms. O'Keefe for the first time I'd ever admit to anybody there was at least the possibility that I drank too much sometimes. <laughs> this was a very serious tactical error. <laughs> Three days later, I was a prisoner in a mental institution in Stanford, Connecticut. <laughs> and I was only there a matter of moments when I discovered a very serious architectural deficiency <laughs> in the building. <laughs> there was no doorknob on my side <laughs> of the door. And I was overcome with great feelings of outrage and self-pity because in addition to everything else horrible that was going on that day, it was the occasion of my 35th birthday. And I mentioned this to a man in a white coat who was standing around, and I very carefully explained to that cretin 
that on that very day I had attained age 35. And therefore, under the Constitution of the United States of America, I was eligible for the office of president. <laughs> he urged me not to plan any campaigns. <laughs> he said there were two other presidents in residence. And he went away and he left me. He abandoned me. And I came up for air about a week later. Was visited by the staff of the hospital. They, of course, were psychiatrists. This is a very fancy rattle box, as befitted a man of my stature, not some goddamn state supported institution for the indigent. How you doing, Clance? <laughs> uh, And I gave three different stories to three different doctors, and I thought I was very slick. And uh, they called me in the next day and said I was in grave danger of being expelled from a mental institution. <laughs> ah, they said I was not cooperating. What a lie. I was cooperating. I was. I was playing Monopoly with three guys, one of whom thought I was his real estate broker. <laughs> And if you know anything about the game of Monopoly and some nut thinks you're his broker, you could do very, very well. <laughs> hey, listen, I had the boardwalk, I had some hotels, and uh, I wasn't thinking about drinking. The Monopoly therapy was working. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's just as good as the bullshit they hand out today. Ah. Uh, you get in touch you get in touch with your inner child and get in touch with your feelings, yeah, sure. You better get in touch with your sponsor or your ass is gonna fall off. <laughs> don't play those don't play those games. I'm too old. So the next day this very they they said you have a visitor. Oh, I visit. I didn't have any visitors. Who would visit me? So I went into my uh, executive type pad at cell and I waited. <laughs> into the room comes very, very imposing looking guy and, and he says, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Hospital's given up on you, pal. I reverted to my boyhood in the Bronx. I said, Alcoholics Anonymous, you rotten son of a bitch. And I started with him. Now, you're not going to believe this. You will not believe it. You know what he said to me? He said, shut up. <laughs> I intuitively forgave him <laughs> because I knew they had neglected to tell him who I was. So I began to tell him who I was. He said, sit down and shut up. Well, he was a very imposing looking guy, and I was not well. And so for the first time in 35 years, I sat down, and uh, he explained to me, as we are instructed in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, what life had been for him, what he had been like, how he had come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and what his life was like now. It was a very interesting story. And he said, would you like to go to, with me to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous? <clears throat> <clears throat> Do you mean, <laughs> sir, to go with you outside to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, outside, I said, I'm going with you. <laughs> and he gave me some matches. <laughs> Nobody else allowed me to have any matches. <laughs> so he was okay with me. And that's how it started. We went off. This was in 1963. Off we went. And he made arrangements 
for me to go locally when I got out, and I got out, and I came back to where I lived, and I started to go locally, and I don't remember so much of all of that. I was turned loose uh, with a large jar of those pills that they used to routinely give alcoholics in those days. In those days, it was considered alcoholism was considered a, de a disease that was caused primarily by a Valium deficiency. <laughs> and uh, so they would give you all these pills to eat when you got out. And I was eating them, and my head buzzed a lot, and uh, I was floating along. So I don't remember so much all of that, but I know myself fairly well. I figured I would come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You would recognize me as a superior person. You would elect me your president. Uh, I was always president if I joined something. I always became the president. I would serve a term as your president, and then you'd give me a little dinner and a plaque, and that would be that. So ten months later, I was very, very, very drunk. Very drunk. I lasted ten months. And, of course, I was drunk, drunk with a great difference because I had turned away from the great power that is in the program. And this was very, very different. Things happened to me. I stayed drunk, you know, for a period of time. I won't take you through all of that because you have things to do and I have a plane to catch. But just let me tell you, it was, it was the worst experience of my life. It was, it was the worst. Murder. It was murder. It was pure and simple murder. I would drink a week, and then I wouldn't drink a month, and I'd drink a month, and I wouldn't drink a week, and I'd drink here, and I wouldn't drink there. And I would drink and go to meetings. I would go to meetings and drink. I never knew what the hell I was bouncing around. I never knew where I'd be. I just never knew. Things began to happen to me. That had never happened to me before. Boy, they happened fast. They happened fast. Things that never happened to me before. Of course, I was removed from the faculty. Dismissed as a tenured full professor of law. And all of that job, which involves a lot of things, all of the honors and the prestige and, and the money, was all gone in about 15 minutes. They didn't need a hearing from me. They just threw me out. And they were right. I was in serious, I mean very, very serious, personal, professional, and financial difficulties. Very, very, very serious. And I lost the affection of all those who were around me. And for... I guess the last six months that I drank, I basically lived in my car, and I could not stop drinking. I couldn't stop. It wasn't as though I didn't know about drinking. I knew about drinking. What the hell? I knew about it. I had a memory. I remembered the neighborhood. I knew what happened to people like me. The Irish say it's the creature. When the creature gets you, you're dead. I knew that. I knew about my family. I'd been to the funerals. I knew what happened to people that drank as I drank. But our book tells us self-knowledge avails you nothing. The fact that I knew about it didn't stop me from doing it. And so I drank. And so I drank. And I'll tell you this. I really did not think I'd ever stop drinking didn't think it would happen. But my time came one day. My time came. I don't know any more about this than you do. But it seems to me that there is a time for all of us. And it seems to me that there is a time for each of us. I say to you that there is a line somewhere beyond which you are not permitted to go. And I say to you that there is a point somewhere 
below which you are simply not permitted to go. And it seems to me that there is a level of pain somewhere beyond which no human is required to endure. I don't know where this line is for you. I only know what happened to me. And this, I think, is a personal and an individual thing. And I think it is different in each case. And for some, it may be death. And that's the way it was for my brother Billy. They called one night from the vets, and he was dead in many apples. And so my hero, my brother, died the way alcoholics do, without friends and without family. And he was a long, long way from our neighborhood. But I'll tell you this, my brother Billy doesn't drink anymore. And that's how he stopped. And for other people, it could be something trivial. Who knows? It's different. But we all come to it in our own time and in our own way. We all come to it. And I arrived on a day that really wasn't much different from any other day. I was three or four days away from a drink. I was in this place where I had gotten a job. I was nervous. I was thirsty. There was a bar in the lobby of the building. And I was thinking it over. I had some money. I had settled a case. I had some dough. And uh, I made a phone call to a longtime member of this program who was a fellow I knew, a lawyer, a longtime friend of mine. And his name was John, and he's my sponsor. And I told him what was going on with me that day, and he said, well, I'll be over. I don't have much to do. So he came over to my office, and he walked in that office, and he looked so good. And I felt so bad. So I said to him, how can I be as, as successful as you are in AA? He gave me that look. You know that look that sponsors have? <laughs> and he said, don't drink and go to the meetings. You'll be all right. I said, no, no, John, but crap. I said, save that for the dummies. See, you really don't understand my problem, my real problem, is this place where I work. I'm a much too good lawyer to be in this dump. <laughs> yeah, he said, well, if you don't drink and you go to some meetings, you might get a better better place. I said, you know, at home it's worse. I'm not even allowed to go up there anymore. Yeah, he said, well, you know, if you don't drink and you go to the meetings, you, know, <laughs> you might work something out there. I said, you know, I'm being sued by a bank. Oh, yeah, he said, I heard about it. A misunderstanding about a loan application. <laughs> well, he says, you know, those cases get settled. I began to sense that there was no dialogue there. <laughs> and so did he, because he said, come on, you're not doing anything. And, and he made a couple of phone calls from my phone. Took me over to Grand Central, put me on a train up and... It's about 40 minutes to where I live. And about 20 minutes into the train ride, I reconsidered. You understand? You know, what the hell? Did I, I must have panicked. <laughs> uh, I got my hand in my pocket. There's about 6,000 in there. What the hell did I call him for? <laughs> don't drink, right? Yeah, don't drink my ass. Just wait till this plane st train stops. I show you don't drink. You know, yeah, don't drink this for a while, Charlie. And when I train stopped, I got off, and standing on the platform was my mailman. The guy who delivered the mail, his name was Al, and he was chairman of the local group. 
And Al said, get in the car. I said, Al, I don't hang out with mailmen. No offense. I don't hang out with mailmen. He said, somebody call me about you from New York. Get in the car. Man of my stature could not afford a fist fight with a mailman or anybody else for that matter. I get killed. So I got in Al's car. I said, Al, I'm in deep shit here, Al. Yeah, he said, well, if you don't drink it, you go to the moon. <laughs> so Al took me up to the meeting that night. It was November the 24th, 1965. I haven't had a drink since. First, I had that day, you know. I think of these guys. I had that day first. I had that day because they gave it to me. They made me a gift. They gave me a day. And because of all the days that followed, I had that first day from them. I've never been able to be as good a sponsor as my sponsor. I've just never been able to. He was some piece of work. He really was. I'd say, John, I don't feel well. He'd say, oh, this may be as good as you'll ever feel. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'd say, when do you think I'm going to get a good job? He said, you had one. You had a great job. You were a law professor. You'll never get a job like that again. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, maybe. Well, when would I get it like an adequate job? <laughs> oh, he said, when you're ready. I said, oh, that's good. When will I be? How will I know I'm ready? He said, you'll have a good job. <laughs> I'm dealing with a Zen master here, you know. <laughs> I said to him, I'm a nervous wreck. For Christ's sake, I'm a nervous wreck. What do you expect me to do? He said, hang on. I said, how do you hang on? He said, let go. Where are you going with this kind of a guy, you know? <laughs> he said, we thought it over. Me and the rest of the old farce. He said, we thought it over. Based on your obvious intelligence, your wonderful educational background, we think seven meetings a week ought to do it. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, you can't push me around. Uh, so I went to nine. <laughs> Who the hell do they think they are? <laughs> and I, I, and I learned my, I learned my business. And, and I've been around now since 1965, and I, it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say I've been in a meeting every night since. I think that's true. Sometimes, I guess, I've been in hospitals. Otherwise, I was talking to dinner last night. I go to eight meetings a week now. I like AA meetings. I love AA meetings, love AA people, love the program. Want to be a member, want to be a member. And I'll tell you what I think now, I'll tell you what I think. I was talking to Clancy, graciously gave me some time to talk the other night. <laughs> he spoke for two hours, I got about four minutes, I think. <laughs> it's only right, it's only fair, it's only right. But, uh, you know, I was supposed to tell you this is my opinion, and I don't speak for AA. And, well, I don't believe any of that shit. <laughs> I'm telling you the absolute truth here. <laughs> now, you can take it or you can leave it. I don't care what you do with it. But this is it. Now, here's what's going on. Alcoholics like you and like me are born not feeling good. We're not sick. We don't have to go to a hospital. We don't feel good. We just don't feel good. It's a goddamn hassle. <laughs> From day one, we don't feel good. We don't like that 
house. We don't like that neighborhood. We don't like those brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and cousins and uncles and aunts. It's all a great big pain in the ass, and why don't they leave us alone? <laughs> we just don't feel good. <laughs> and it's something behind, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not big enough, I'm not short enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm not smart enough. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. You can't tell anybody because they don't give a shit. <laughs> and you find out, I don't feel good. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> so you're 13 or 14 and somebody gives you some of that. You drink that. You drink another one. And boom! You're with Keith in Pittsburgh. You feel good. That's all. For the first time in your whole life, you feel good. Good enough. You know, good enough. So you have some more. What the hell else would you do? If one is good, huh, Two is better, four is maybe enough, take eight, you never can tell, 16. <laughs> and then, of course, it turns on you, as it did for all of us. And then we get to where we, we come here. Nobody came here riding on a crest. We can go to meetings, eh? And that's true. Don't we? And when you are new, that is the best thing you could ever hear. Don't drink and go to me. Yeah, but my wife, don't drink and go to me. Yeah, but the job, don't drink and go to me. Because that's what you need when you're first here. But Alcoholics Anonymous surely is more than don't drink and go to meetings. We all know that. Don't drink and go to meetings is to Alcoholics Anonymous as breathing is to life. If you don't not drink and go to meetings, you're going to drink and die. But breathing is not life. Inhaling and exhaling, that's not life. There's more, much, much more to it than that. And my brother Immerslin explained it so well, as he always does. It's not the alcohol. It's something else is the matter. Something else is the matter with us, with me. Something else. And that's why our whole program is an inventory, self-seeking, self-searching. And then what's the remedy? What is the remedy for what we have? And it's very, very simple. And I hear it every night at every meeting I go to. They tell me what the problem is, and they tell me what the solution is. And I prefer the solution. And here's what they say at every meeting I go to. They say that I'm an alcoholic and I can't manage my own life. They say probably no human power can relieve my alcoholism, but God could and would if, if he was sought. And so it seems to me the problem is, is nothing less than a seeking or a search for an understanding of God. And I speak to you from without a religious base. I don't count myself as a member of any religion. Yet this is the conclusion I have come to. If you read in our book, this is our book, the blue one. And then you read this black part here, see? <laughs> now don't read this other shit in the back there, that white part, that's no good. Do that. And we read this book in around the third step. It says this, that remarkable things happen. It says when we sincerely took such a position, the position of the third step, remarkable things happen to us. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided for us. And this is a spiritual law of supply. And does it make sense to you that if you're working for me, will I not give you everything you need to do my work? Will I not make sure that you are comfortable doing my work? And if you are here to do his work, 
he will provide. That's the spiritual law of supply. And I have seen it over and over and over and over again. And this is what the book says. It says he does not make hard terms for those who seek him. True? True. Is this a hard term? Is this weekend a hard term? Is going to your group a hard term? To people who know you, care for you, love you? Not a hard term. It says that as we draw near to him, he will reveal himself to us. True? True. Clancy said it last night. He revealed himself to Clancy, to me, to you, as the God of our traditions, a loving authority, who only wants what's good for us. The spiritual life, our book says, is not a theory. We have to live it. And it is not difficult to live it. I don't find it so hard. Let me tell you two things. Listen to this, please. Still, you may say, I will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. So you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. You and I have always have relied on people from time to time. We have been disappointed. I tell you sadly that people have relied on me from time to time. And they have been disappointed. And so it says here, your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Did you not crave fellowship when you came? Did you not look, as I did, for someone who would understand? Jesus Christ, is there anybody who knows what's going on here? Is there no one who can help me? And I found the fellowship I could grant. It says our book is meant to be suggestive only. Imagine that. <laughs> My sponsor never read that. <laughs> we realize we know only a little. Imagine someone like me saying, we realize we know only a little. It's communism. That's what that God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who still suffers. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, obviously, you cannot transmit something that you do not have. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. And I consider this weekend a great event that has come to pass. It really has. Now here comes the Oxford group. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. I would be remiss if I did not thank Mike and the committee, or who the hell it was, that had the good judgment to ask me to 
come by here to be in uh, in a weekend with Keith and Clancy and all the rest. It's just a great thrill for me. Great and a great pleasure as well. I'm one of the members of AA who get to go around a lot and I've seen so many of you in so many different places. And this is the way I end. I have an ending. There's a pamphlet in Alcoholics Anonymous that has been very dear to me since the day it was published. It's called The Member's View of Alcoholics Anonymous, written by one of Clancy's friends in California. And at the very end of that pamphlet, the author takes a biblical turn. And he recalls a time when John the Baptist was once again languishing in one of Herod's prisons. And John sent two of his friends to inquire of his cousin, Jesus, as to whether or not he was the Messiah. And these two men walked with the Lord, and they stopped him one day. And they said to him, Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we have been waiting for? Or should we wait for another? And the Lord really didn't answer that question. But he said to these two men, Go back to John and tell John only what you have seen and only what you have heard. Tell John that the blind can see and that the lame walk. And tell John that the deaf can hear and that the sick are made well. And tell John that the poor have the gospel brought to them. In my early training, I was told that the word poor in that context could mean poor in spirit. And everyone knows that the word gospel simply means good news. And so, my dear, dear sisters and brothers, in happy conference assembled, if you will accept a report from me based on my years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I will tell you only what I have seen and only what I have heard. And based upon that personal observation, it seems to me that the blind do see and the lame do walk. And I know, I know that the deaf can hear. And most certainly, most certainly, the sick are made well. And I have seen over and over and over again through the longest day and into the darkest night, the good news of this program brought to the alcoholic who suffers, the poor in spirit. God bless you.